Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Today I'm going to be taking my first look at the oldest Hornby Loco I have ever owned. As part of their centenary celebrations in 2020, Hornby produced a range of locomotives that were replicas of some of their original O-gauge tin plate locos from way back in the day. And I won't lie to you, I thought these looked really cool. I thought it was great to bring back replicas of these original Hornby models, and I was all for buying one to review. But there was one thing putting me off, and I'm sure you can guess what that one thing would be, because it's the same thing that always puts me off with expensive Hornby locos, and that is, of course, the price. The RRP for one of these locos was over £500, and quite frankly, that was just way more than I was willing to pay for such a primitive locomotive by about £400. And honestly, it seems as though a lot of people felt the same way because Hornby only produced a hundred of each of these locos, and I believe there was four different ones. So such a small production run suggests in itself that Hornby knew perhaps that these would not be very popular, and they were right, because now it's 2023, three years after the Hornby centenary celebrations, and plenty of retailers still have these models in stock. And in fact, the model center has some in stock which have been reduced to half price and they still haven't sold them. They are still there in stock at the time of filming. So it's a bit of a flop really, isn't it? I think people just are not willing to pay that much money. That means across all of the different Hornby retailers, including Hornby's own website, they have not been able to sell even 100 of each of these models. And I'm not surprised because I think it's quite obvious that such a primitive loco would not cost that much to produce. And even though some of them have now been reduced to half price, it's still far too much money. I am not paying that for such a primitive loco but I still want to look at an O-Gage Loco from Hornby made of tin plate, and if I'm not going to buy one of the new replicas, my only other option is to look back in time and try to get an original one. So I took a look on eBay, and sure enough, none of the original models are anywhere near as expensive as Hornby's new replicas, which is ridiculous, isn't it? Now, maybe if I was to find an original Hornby Loco that was in perfect condition, never used, maybe that would be worth £500 or something, but at the time of looking, I did not see anything like that at all. In fact, any of the models that did come up that high in price had track and rolling stock with them as well. However, I didn't spend all of that money. I managed to pick up this one for just £49.99. Now, the loco I managed to get was not one of the locos that Hornby replicated during their centenary year. I believe the one I have here is slightly later, from 1949, but that still makes this loco nearly 75 years old. Also, unlike the new Hornby replicas, the loco I have here is not electric. This is a clockwork locomotive. Now, would I have preferred an electric loco? Maybe. I mean, I'd be very interested to see what an electric model from the 1940s would be like inside, but I've got a lot of electric locos. How many of my current locos are clockwork? Well, none of them. I don't have a single clockwork loco. So this, I think, will be very, very interesting to me. It will be my first clockwork loco. Really interested to see how it works and what it looks like, being that it was built in approximately 1949. So this only cost me £50. That's 10 times less than I would have had to have paid for a modern replica and I'd prefer an original one anyway. So we're gonna get this out, we're gonna take a close look at it, see if it still works, that will be interesting, and see what a model might have looked like if you'd have purchased one 75 years ago. Okay, the oldest loco I have ever owned. I've had the box open, but I've not really looked within, so let's have a look. Not sure how old this packaging is, it probably is just some sort of replacement box, so I won't go into any detail on that, but, oh, we're upside down. Here we go, there is the loco, and I have to say, even though it's O-gauge, it's a lot larger than I was expecting it to be. It seems like a, a bigger loco 
than the pictures seem to portray. But let's start getting this out. Let's pull the tender out first of all. And sure enough, yeah, this is all tin plate. Not injection molded. It looks like all of these parts are pressed out of just pieces of tin. And even the wheels appear to have been made in the same way. Uh, if I show you underneath, you can see just about Hornby Made in England um, Meccano Limited, I think that is underneath. So that's a very, very original locomotive. Uh, no coal load or anything. I don't know if these would have come with coal loads or not, but uh, mine doesn't seem to have. And this is something that I was wondering about. In a little bag here, we have a key. Now, obviously, you don't need a controller or anything to use this loco, but you do need a key in order to wind it up and get the clockwork mechanism going. And this says, gauge for rails, Meccano Limited. Oh, so this key has a little gauge on it <laughs> so that you can check that your rails are in gauge. That's very interesting. And then, of course, the other end, you stick into the loco to wind it up. I mean, I guess you know how a wind-up key works. Or maybe not, I don't know. Right, star of the show then. Let's have a look at the loco. See what kind of shape it's in. All right, so it's quite heavy. Yeah, it's quite a weighty loco, I would say. And you can tell that this is kind of 75 years old. It looks a little bit tired in places. You can see that fingers have worn away some of the lining here on the splashes. But um, I think all things considered, it is in remarkably good condition. It does seem as though it's been looked after reasonably well. Uh, the cab has some controls inside it. And of course, I don't have any instructions with this loco. So it will just be a case of having to figure this out myself. But um, if I had to guess at this point, one of these levers would be to start and stop the loco. And perhaps another one would be to set this loco into forwards or reverse. I'm guessing this will be able to reverse. But uh, I'll have to wind it up later on and see if it works. And there's another label inside there that says Hornby, made in England by Meccano Limited, Type 501. And the Type 501 was an updated version of the Hornby Number no. 1 locomotive, which was introduced in 1939, I think. And it was post-war. These locos are not realistic, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think they are just kind of made up. The running numbers do exist, but they don't tend to correspond to the 040s that they are fitted to. Anyway, let's have a look underneath, shall we? And look at that. Now, that's a complex mechanism right there, isn't it? When you think about just the, the motor with a worm drive on it and maybe two or three gears, this looks totally different and I should be able to just gently turn the wheels slightly. Yeah, as you can see, they are actually remarkably free rolling. Yeah, very, very free. So hopefully this loco will work. But let's have a closer look at this thing. Obviously, I'm not going to be worshipping the level of detail, but let's see what sort of detail you would get on a loco from this period. So here it is up close and personal for you, an original Hornby Type 501 locomotive. And I guess so far I've been referring to this through force of habit as a model, but that's probably a little bit inaccurate because clearly this really is not intended to be a model. It's definitely more toy-like than model-like. Obviously in the 1930s and 40s, the concept of model railways was a thing, but they were very, very expensive. As were these, this toy grade locomotive would have been incredibly expensive. And had these been even more model-like, had they been more accurate, etc., etc., then I reckon the cost would have been far too prohibitive and it wouldn't have been a great business decision. However, if this was produced in 1949, then much more realistic models were just around the corner at very, very affordable prices. And that's because, of course, during the 1950s, Triang or Rovex Plastics would come along and produce the first of the new generation of Hornby, as we know them today, locomotives. That would be the Princess. And obviously, when you consider that that is only a few years ahead of this, the leap forward in model-like qualities and detailing is absolutely massive. But anyway, back to this thing, there is some evidence of this loco being a little bit more model-like, and they do say that these 501s were a little bit improved over the earlier models, and I'm actually quite surprised by the level of detail on this thing. 
Accuracy, not so much. I believe this exact model was put into loads of different liveries, and like I say, the numbers don't really match up to basic 040 tender engines. But in terms of the detailing, there's quite a bit going on here. So you've got these very large metal handrails, which are separately fitted. Obviously, these are not separately fitted in order to make the model look more realistic. It's because it's template, and to mould a handrail onto the side of the boiler there really just wouldn't have been possible. But they're very basic handrails, literally just bolted on with these handrail holders at either end, and the handrail itself is just a metal rod. We've got these separately fitted buffers. I reckon these are cast. I don't think they look like tin plate. And there are one or two cast parts on this loco, including the wheels. Yep, the driving wheels, they look like they are cast metal, obviously not tin plate. Although, as I say, the tender wheels are definitely tin. We do have lamp brackets. I'm very surprised to see that. 1949 early clockwork loco, it's got lamp brackets. It's got the separately fitted smoke box dart. Again, that's quite a surprise. You would more expect just a blank smoke box, wouldn't you? But no, it's got a dart. And there is some molded detail in inverted commas. Yeah, you can see there's some sort of hinges that have been punched into that smoke box piece. And one of the little flaps that holds that on, one of the little tabs, that seems to be masquerading as a lamp bracket, which I think is quite clever. You've got the little dome, which is attached to the boiler, again, via a couple of tabs, which are just bent around the inside of the boiler. And then you've got this splasher here, which I guess hides some of the workings, and it's got a little opening in it for the key. Now, the loco is obviously painted. It's painted into a what is supposed to be LNER green. I reckon this banding on the boiler might have supposed to have been white and black. <laughs> Maybe it's just yellowed over the years because it really does look more like a, a sort of BR green, doesn't it, with the orange and black lining and not the white and black. But on the side of the cab, I would say the orange here looks more like white, so maybe that's what it would have been originally. And at the same goes for the sort of splasher paintwork as well. The top of the cab is also a separate tin piece, and that's painted black, as is the smoke box. And here's a bit of a better look inside the cab. Yeah, we've just got those two knobs. They're not for twisting, I don't think. I think you push and pull those in order to operate the loco. And then the tender, I think, gives us a little bit more information on how this loco was assembled, because you can see the sort of tin tabs which bend around the different pieces to hold them together. It's quite a lot more complex, really, isn't it, than just having injection molded bodies that drop out of an injection molding machine with limited input. Not only do all of these parts have to be put together, fitted together, and then have the tabs bent around, they've also got to be individually produced as well. So you can see why these locos would have been quite expensive back in the day. And you can also appreciate how much of a jump those plastic models would have been far cheaper and easier to build and also far more detailed because all of that detail was just incorporated as part of the molding and it was much quicker and simpler to reproduce anyway there's quite a bit going on here's the springs <laughs> yeah look at that obviously again just sort of punched into the tin you can see there's a little bit of detail there but again the plastic that would come along a few years later would totally outshine that I reckon and then around the back look at this we've got some separately fitted lamp brackets again quite a surprising feature on such a basic looking loco but they are trying they're trying to make this more model like and then again more cast buffers on the back one of them's got a nasty chunk out of it unfortunately but again we can forgive it some minor imperfections because it is incredibly incredibly old and here's a look at the couplings on the tender we've got this sort of hook and loop coupling which is a little bit like the double O gauge ones that we would see in later years except the hook stays in position and it is the loop that moves up and down to engage onto the hook which is interesting not sure if the loco is supposed to have one of those moving loops but mine doesn't have that whether mine has just lost it over the years or whether it was just the tender that was supposed to have that I'm not sure but yeah, the Loco has just got the hook, and it looks like a slightly different design of hook as well, as you can see. So yeah, that's quite interesting. And the final thing really is, I'm not sure how well the performance is going to go with this, because right here it sat on a piece of Lima track, and the flanges on the Loco and the tender are way too large. And as you can see, they are just sort of catching on the sleepers. Now on the Pico track that I've got on my main layout, 
there's still a bit of that going on but there seems to be a little bit more clearance between the top of the rail and the sleepers so maybe the loco will run but do bear in mind this will not be the track that this loco was designed for the original rails sat way above the sleepers so obviously the wheels and the flanges would not catch on those so do bear that in mind if you want to buy one of these like i did and run it on your o gauge layout you might have some problems of course you could just turn the flanges of the wheels down but that's not something that i really want to do with such an historical model but anyway that's a close look at some of the locos details and little intricacies let's at least try and put it onto the track and see if we can get it to stretch its legs so there she is, this marvellous old locomotive on the track for the first time in goodness knows how many years, hopefully to give us a fresh performance. Now in terms of weight, this holds up quite well against modern O-gauge locos. Loco and tender weigh in at 588 grams and the tender only accounts for 85 grams of that, which means that the loco itself, I suppose because it is made of tin plate, because it's all metal, is actually heavier than, say, a Dapol Terrier in O-Gauge today. So, provided there's enough torque in the mechanism and such, this should be a decent hauler. Speaking of the mechanism, I've given it a little bit of oil just on the gears, and I've also been pushing and pulling the levers in the cab during this review to film the controls, and nothing's been happening, which either means the Loco needs winding up, or it's broken. <laughs> so I've got the key in my hand and I'm going to give this a little bit of a wind up. I don't know exactly how much winding up these need so I'm going to err on the side of caution. I'm just going to give it three to five winds and if there's a lot of resistance I will stop and then obviously if it doesn't start running properly I'll, I might give it a little bit more but obviously I do want to be careful. So as I understand it you just insert the key into the side like this and just give it a bit of a wind. Let's give it three to start with. Oh, no, let's give it five. Give it two more. Seems to be winding properly anyway, doesn't it? And I'm not entirely sure which lever I need to use to set the loco in motion. I want it to go backwards, first of all. So if it starts going forwards, I'm going to stop it. <laughs> but let's try. Let's try pushing this one in. Oh, off it goes. It's going. Oh. Very, very rickety, of course. And the ricketiness, of course, is because I'm running it on modern track, not because there's something wrong with it. Uh, anyway, yeah, it was quite lively, wasn't it, that? <laughs> Has it got enough juice to carry on? Uh, well, yeah, it's just it really is just struggling on these points quite a bit. So let's get it on to my main run. Right, so it made it to the end of the track, and now I'm going to try and change the direction, see if we can get this to go forwards. By the looks of it, it doesn't like points, so I might have to just assist it over the points, but then after that, it's got quite a good run. So let's see if we can make it go. Right, so the lever closest to me is obviously to make it stop and go. It's on go at the moment, so let's just change the direction, hopefully, with the other lever. And I don't know if I need to wind it up some more, but let's just let it go. Give it a little push. Oh yeah, off it goes. Yeah, well, off it goes. Look at that. And it's come to a stop just there. So on, you know, a bit of a wind there, five winds or so, it's gone quite away. I'm going to give it a bit more then. Let's, In fact, let's bring it back to the start. Let me wind it up and let's see how far we can go with it. Right, so let's give it a little bit more on the old winding. Again, if I feel like this is getting too tight, I'm going to stop. But um, let's give it a few more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to stop there because it is feeling a little bit tight. So <laughs> I've given it more this time, so I don't know if it's just going to shoot off like crazy. But let's make sure it's on the track right. Yeah, let's give it some. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's going for it. <laughs> Look at it go. Still going. Cool. Yeah, got a fair way there, didn't it? Has it stuck on something or is it going to carry on? 
No, I reckon it could still have some juice in it. Uh, the cylinders are just a bit too wide to fit behind that beam. So this is as far as we can go. But let's change direction again. Let's see how much juice we're actually going to get out of seven wines. Let's make sure the tender's on properly, even though the tender's absolutely crazy. Yeah, the tender is just all over the place. Uh, let's, let's go. Let's see. Push that in. Off we go. Right, this time it's slowed down and stopped on the curve, so have we run out now, or shall I just give it a push? Yeah, I think it's pretty much drained there, isn't it? So you're not, you don't get far, do you? You don't get far on a single wind-up. Let's try it again. Let's keep going. No, I give it another push, and without winding it anymore, it's carried on. That's <laughs> yeah, quite odd, that, isn't it? Let's see if we can go any further. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off it goes. It's going to hit the buffer stop. Right. So I think the thing with it is because it's effectively running off a spring, the further it runs, the less torque it has. So, yeah, it gets over these sticky spots when it's fully wound up. But then as it starts to run out of energy, it uh, struggles a bit more. Now, again, that's probably just because there's a lot of friction here because of those big flanges and the sleepers on this Pico track. On some original track, I suppose the friction would be less. The tender wouldn't be jumping around quite as much and maybe it'd get further. But uh, yeah, on here, it's pretty much using all the <laughs> Loco's energy just to move itself along without any rolling stock. And I don't have any compatible rolling stock, but... Let's wind it up again. Let's let's go for another run, see if I can get some more shots. It's quite hard to film, of course, because I can't just set it going with my controller and <laughs> use the shuttle system. Completely manual control on this. But uh, yeah, let's have a few more shots of it running, and then I'll see what sort of torque this has got. I'll do the uh, tractive effort test. But yeah, a few more running shots. So there you have it, yeah, honestly, it's quite a lot of fun. It works reasonably well, I think, given that it's on the wrong sort of track, and the range is pretty much as I expected. Um, it's hard to say what the range is for this, because it's not like a battery, you can't give it in time, for instance, you can't say it will run for 10 minutes or whatever, because it's all dependent on distance. If you put loads of rolling stock behind it and made it go really slow, you could probably get it to run for minutes on end, but I really got this to run probably 10, 15, 20 meters at a time before it would need winding up again. Again, though, I, I can't tell you how accurate that is because obviously this thing is almost 75 years old. Maybe one in better condition would run a little bit further. Maybe when they were brand new, they would go a lot further as well. I can say, though, that I tried this without the tender, and when I did that, it went insanely quickly. It basically used all of its energy in a very short period of time, and went scarily fast indeed. Similarly, though, on the track that it was designed for, where there's less friction, maybe it would go a little bit further, especially as it's able to build up a bit of momentum. But let's have a look, see what the pulling power is like. Obviously, there's very little torque here, so I don't think we're going to get much. But um, if I hook this around here a little bit, let's see, might be a bit futile. There we go, that's hooked on. And uh, if I give it some juice, let's try. Give it a little bit of a nudge, I don't really want to help it out too much. But as you can see, it seems to have a fair bit, maybe 0 0.3 newtons. So it's certainly not a powerful loco. Maybe maybe I should try it off this track. Let's 
try it on just the table here. Yeah, 0 0.4, so it doesn't have any flanges to knock on there. And as you can see, it's not turning its wheels or anything. I have to sort of let it go. So yeah, it's not a powerful loco. It is very, very primitive. But I have to say there's something quite fun about operating this. The fact that you have to effectively refuel it by winding it up, and the fact that you actually have to reach into the cab and operate its controls to make it go, is a very new experience for me. I'm used to a control station somewhere completely different from the Loco that allows you to remotely operate the model. Whereas with these, you really do have to be like a little driver. You really do have to use the controls on board the Loco, which is cool. I actually really enjoyed that aspect of it. But there you go. That is my look at a 1949, approximately, clockwork steam locomotive from Hornby really good price for this it's a real piece of history and i only paid 50 pounds for it so i'm going to look after this i'm not going to run it too much i don't think because obviously i don't want the thing to break down but i hope you enjoyed looking at it as much as i did let me know what you think about this have you got any clockwork trains what is the range like on those did mine perform typically or would you expect different results do let me know in the comments but for now thank you again for watching and i will see you very very soon Let's say goodbye then. Let's get this loco back on the track. And let's send it off on its way. Uh, forwards, please. Goodbye.